and we want you to find rejuvenation in the presence of God. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Well, we stop there. <laughs> they shall mount up with wings as eagles. So you better grow wings now. <laughs> My dear people, you know, we can't have haggard, what shall I say, weary, complaining, whining set of people. In any army, we don't go in anywhere with such people. Anyway, we are going to begin today. Pardon me. Galatians 6 chapter, please. I just wish to bring before you this afternoon how uh, the dear Lord initiated me into revival. The ninth verse, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, folks, some people develop cramps in a distance race. Some people simply get too tired. They say, every muscle in my body ached. But I kept at it till I breasted the tip. You know, the Lord never offers us an easy ride, but the Lord tells us, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I have always found a yoke is normally something which is heavy, you see, as something which is saddled on you, and you're plowing or hauling a weight or something. But the Lord says, my yoke is easy. And I found the yoke of the Lord easy. Foundations must be right. Foundation. Repentance towards God. Now, what's so hard there? If I have wronged you, is it not just proper that I should come and say sorry? Some people find it so difficult to say sorry. You have to wring it out of them, as it were. They can't say sorry. I don't know how they manage it to live with themselves. You must be finding it quite hard to live with yourself. You know, I've said sorry to so many people, and when I say sorry, I want people to hear it. You see, if I have been hasty in my speech or accuse somebody of something of which they were not really guilty, and I saw that I was wrong, immediately I would say, sorry, then what, what's the big deal in that? You know, some people do find it very difficult. They can't say sorry to a wife 
They can't say sorry to a boss. They simply don't know how to humble themselves. Now, here we are told that we should not be weary in well-doing. Now, when I started as a young fellow, I did see some young fellows who, who were ahead, ahead of me. Some very fine people whose example had stirred me greatly. Now, friends, as the battles of life seem to come upon people, Slowly, some of them yield an inch here, yield an inch there, wilt a little here, wither a little there, and the result of that is that they are not running the race which they ought to be doing. So I've seen some people start well, but they did not persevere. I was not brilliant, never brilliant, stodgy, kept going, obeying the truth, that's all. The truth which God had given, I obeyed. If I needed to humble myself, sure, I went ahead and did it. But prayer became a delight to me. You see, prayer is a discipline. That is, when you come home after a long day's game, cricket, or a soccer, match where you threw in all your power into the game or hockey and all these matches I used to play in competitive tournaments and that meant of course that after a day's work at school and then followed by a strenuous match, you didn't have much energy. But I would never miss my time of prayer. Never. I will get alone with God and spend at least half an hour in prayer. This would quite recharge me for the rest of the evening. You know, folks, people give lip service to prayer. They won't stop. You know, they flick the channels or something. They, stuck, they get stuck on some show or game or whatever. You know, I've been telling people, don't you buy a television because I am speaking over these channels. Because most of it is rubbish. It's very stultifying, corrupting. And soon you will find that you're trying to do and act unconsciously just like some of those folks who are earning a lot of money by their play acting. No, so many people lose precious time. You know, I think our culture today 
is being very sadly undermined by the television. What filthy words come out of them? Have you seen some of these sports fellows? And even as they're right in the game, they'll spit. Evidently, they did never saw on our buses no spitting. <laughs> huh? What a shame! You know, they're all tobacco chewers, you know, many of them. So, and uh, as it is turning up, they're on steroids. That is, they're cheating. and hurting themselves for life. Now, this is what is happening around us. You know, sport should be sporty, meaning you never kick another in a soccer game. But you can see a soccer game today without somebody clutching at the other fellow's jersey or tripping him up. <laughs> I can't imagine this. I was a soccer back. What utter meanness is that? And they go sprawling. You see, folks, no. We are being affected by all these things and the net result is we have lost out on prayer. But prayer is one of those things like, you know, I suppose some of you have hammered a nail into a piece of wood sometime or another. How do you do it? Stroke upon stroke, right on the head of the nail, until it's right in. Now that's prayer. You know, to us today, prayer seems like a gamble. Say something, and mark you. There are some very deceptive things that are coming in under the garb of religion. One of these deceptive things seems to be what people call, suddenly somebody pops up and says, God is saying that this man is going to be the greatest prophet. Bunch of rubbish. And that's called a great prophecy. And that fellow turns out to be a druggie. Now listen, don't be carried away by all these religious shows. They're not going to help you at all. Prayer life. You go about it the right way, the way that Jesus went. A great while before it was day, Christ went into the wilderness and there prayed. All right, you don't, may not have a big wooded place just next door to you, but you can make it a habit of not going to work without studying the word and praying. Now, look, we will do everything which is essential, but I can't think of anybody going to the Bible in a superficial and skimpy manner. How can you do that? That means you're just saying, hey, here's something. 
which I just do. No. You must get something from the Lord before you shut the book. Get something, some truth from God's word. Let it speak to you. And then, friend, that is your building brick upon brick. So you don't see people growing in faith. Why don't they grow in faith? Faith is nothing but the application of God's word. Obedience to God's word produces faith. You're not just going to have the UPS deliver a packet of faith to you. you know, some people expect some, some way by which they have faith. Well, let me tell you something. One of my uncles, my mother's elder brother, became a pastor, a minister with a Bachelor of Divinity degree. But the poor man was never sure whether, you know, as he put it, God existed. Poor man. He had the education and he was the pastor of a large church when revival broke in and whole families were converted. Boys, girls, young people, husbands, everyone. And even little children, God began to speak to them and my dad had to put them all on the table. You know, where the Lord's Supper is served, there's always a table there. My dad had to stand them on the table in order that the congregation could see little children and they would testify, God spoke to me. Well, and when he saw all that was happening, my uncle said, I should not be pastor anymore because I don't have any real experience of God. Then came his intestinal cancer. And the man was operated on and a long strip of his cancer, a cancerous intestine, was removed. And unfortunately, while returning, from the hospital, the car plunged into a canal and turned over. With great difficulty he came out and the upshot of this was that the wound, the operated area opened up and all the stuff was coming out. When the man lay dying, one night, when he was, when they expected the end to come, my dad and mother were praying in the next room. What happened? Suddenly the patient who was sinking sat up and said, God has touched me. And the operated area which had opened up was sealed and he was healed. He pulled off all the bandage and my father 
went to him and said, Notwithstanding, you're very weak. You better stay still. Next morning, expecting that death would have certainly occurred, the people came to see the body. What did they see? They saw him sitting on a chair. He lived for 35 years after that, if I remember right. I mean, till he was 90 and something before God called him home. But he was converted. He repented. Now, that is faith. Faith where my dad and mother held on to God till God touched him. Now, that was not just saying, Lord, you know all about this and uh, he is sinking now and if it be your will, uh, mm, mm, so on and so on. No, no, no. It was a question of call, taking hold of God and calling on God. Now, be not weary in well-doing. Ye shall reap if you faint not. My dear friends, you know, I saw so many preachers along the line. I'm not happy to tell you this. Preachers! And some of them were touted to be such great people. You know, all in the public eye drawing multitudes of people. I don't know what caused them to stumble. I really don't know. And I don't go into investigating such things. I only feel sad if they bring shame to the name of God. But one thing is clear. Today, filthy Luca is playing a terrible role in Christian work. You know, McDonald's had an advertisement. I didn't quite understand what it was. They produced a t-shirt. Where's the beef? <laughs> well, Where's the beef? You must have given it to the good Indians. <laughs> well, you know, folks, they said this is an ad of the McDonald's. All right. Today, where's the money? Is that the catchy phrase? Where's the money? I've seen people hopping from organization to organization because somebody offered them a little more. From pulpit to pulpit because somebody offered them a little more. Money. You see, money is playing an awful role today. Now, I might have told you this before, but I tell you, I'll tell you again. Sometimes I can be very stubborn, you know. And one day, I came down the mountain. I said goodbye to my wife and little children. They lived in a little cottage, nestling on the side of a high hill, mountain. And I was walking down to the bus station. I suddenly discovered, I said, hey, I didn't bring a penny with me. Hmm. And what am I going to do about the bus ticket? 
I tell you, whether it was laziness or stubbornness, I cannot say, but I said, I am not going up the mountain again. I am heading for the bus station without a penny in my pocket. Let God take care of the rest. So as I was proceeding, here comes round the curve comes the postman. He says, I've got a money order for you. <laughs> of course, that was welcome news. <laughs> and just five rupees. Very small, but enough to cover my bus fare. Where my ticket was waiting for me. You see? Now, this faith, I began to apply to bigger things. You see? Bigger things. And, uh, and I noticed they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Into the millions and now into the tens of millions. And I will not ask anybody. If this is God's work I am doing, let God supply. He is the boss. I am not the boss. I am only the servant. My dear people, and if you look on any of my audiences, you will find hardly any rich person. Ordinary people. Poor people, many of them. And yet, God knows how to run his work. We don't need to make frantic appeals for funds. And you know, everybody is greatly surprised that I never appeal for funds. Why should they be surprised? God says, I will supply all your need according to my riches in Christ Jesus. All your need. That's it. That's the promise of God. But this business of getting weary in the middle faint in the middle. It upsets the whole program. When God has great things for you, here you are mumbling, murmuring, stumbling, lagging in the race, and doing no justice to him at all. I want to tell you, my friends, your Christian life can be a glorious adventure. Mine has been unimaginable adventure. Faith, the application of God's word, never fails. Governments may pass away. Empires fail and disappear. I've seen all these things happening, but God's word never fails. And today, the tentative manner in which we approach God's word is so grievous, so disappointing. Well, if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, fine. Even marriage is approached in that way. Why? People don't have faith. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, fine. What do you mean? Will God fail you? No. See, 
the other day on Sunday, that's just three days ago, I had to address our Sunday morning congregation in another big hall, not this one, but another big hall. There would be somewhere between 2,000 to 3,000 people present. And I said, or it was announced that I had to leave immediately for the airport because I had a very important meeting in the evening, 750 miles away. So I hadn't packed, you know, my packing is a very simple business takes only 15 minutes. Only thing is, suddenly I find I have forgotten my toilet bag <laughs> or some such thing. But I am grateful if I don't forget my passport as I did once. <laughs> yeah, anyway, folks, but in spite of this announcement at my door, there stood, there stood a man with his family. Some time ago he had been brought and he said to me, the man who brought him said, here is a broken family. His wife left him. I said, oh no, we must pray that she will come back. And uh, here was the whole family now. The wife had come back, a total stranger to me, and I could speak to them and pray with them. And the man who had brought this family along, or his friend along in the first place, he had a broken family. I said, no, we, you must pray. You must not look around, look for some other partner. You must pray that your wife will come back. So she came back. Now listen, today we see all kinds of mixed up situations. People are so mixed up. And what is the message we bring into this mixed up situation? Well, sometimes circumstances indicate that it is almost impossible for your relationships to be straightened out. No, you go to God and say, this is an impossible situation from every human standpoint. But have you got, have you not got away in the wilderness? My dear friends, we don't demonstrate the power of God. We just settle for whatever is going on around us. We say it is inevitable and I can do nothing about it. I am the innocent party. Could be. Very often that's the case. But think of the morning's paper today. What rubbish it carries. And of course, the goings on in the palace until very recently, and I, I don't keep current with the news. But the whole time this country 
has been subjected to this kind of questionable models. Flawed models. Contrary to God's word. And how can you see the nation prosper? No wonder people are saying the way to go is to return to the Middle Ages and establish 13th century or culture or enforce that culture on Europe. We are superior. Our philosophy is superior. My dear friends, this is not some kind of slogging match between religions. No, 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 no. I never had to do that. The Lord is able to take care of his own work. You know, when God begins to move, everybody backs down and says, now we know that Jesus is Lord. That's all. All you have to do is to be steady in your testimony. Today, when you can't see somebody who is steady in their testimony, it is so sad. You know, if it is just a passing fan or a passing excitement. What's the good of that? Be not weary in well-doing. My dear friends, today as I go down the road, place after place, place after place, where I labored as a young man, Today, so many people converted, living for the Lord, getting the word of God out. I cannot even stop for a minute or two at so many places. There's simply so many. You see, Multiplying the blessing is God's business. Your business is to just be faithful. You know how it is. Many big pastors are afraid to leave their pulpits on Sundays because they're afraid the crowd will disappear or the assistant pastor will take over, supplant him. What a shocking thing. When I heard this, I was amazed in America. However, what about all these centers? Do you mean to say a particular person needs to be there in order to keep things going? No. God's able to take care of that. But the whole thing revolves around depth. Depth. Today, though, we have become very superficial. We are just satisfied with the surface. We are just not deep. And what kind of building can you build when there is no depth at all to the foundation? Nothing. It's going to crash with the slightest tremor. You know, obedience to God's word. Last of all, please turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 23rd chapter and the 23rd verse. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction 
and understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. And our truth is not for sale. You, you know, we sell God's truth down the river. Britain has seen in its history people who stood for the truth and were burnt at the stake. You know, some of you must read Fox's Book of Martyrs. At least a small rendering of the bigger book. But what was it all about? They stuck to their guns. They stood for the truth. They could have saved their skins and said, Hey, never mind, we will live to fight another day. No. They said, we'll stand by the truth. And they were burnt at the stake. Now all that is gone. If Britain has become a wishy-washy place. And a nation that will not stand on the word of God. It has no chance, simply no chance. You know, folks, you will find that there are people who laugh at every opportunity and call Mr. Bush a buffoon, a clown. But, no, he's no buffoon. He may have his shortcomings, I don't know what they are, but he wants America back to the Ten Commandments. And a man who in the face of such ridicule, of course most of the ridicule comes from Europe. Europe has had very few morals. You see, in their history, European morals were far inferior to the British morals. And of course, writers and historians will say, all right, the royals have always had flawed morals. Now, what are you saying? If the ruler is wanting in his morals, what will happen to a nation? Righteousness exalts a nation. Anyway, friends, spy the truth. Let me tell you that. Truth is costly. You're going to buy it and sell it not down the river. Sell it not, whatever it might cost. Truth is not for sale, for amendment, for watering down. Now, buy the truth. You know, I always think my grandfather, when he renounced Hinduism and idolatry and subsequently all his family wealth, enormous wealth, well, he did the right thing. He became a poor man to follow Jesus. You see, because Always people are saying, hey, somebody gave you money, so you became a Christian. Hmm. Somebody gave you money, that's why you're preaching. No, 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 no. 
buy the truth. It's precious. Sell it not. Let us pray. Loving Father, thou knowest we live in sad times, but we are not going to blame our failure upon the age in which we live. We are not going to say, hey, this is the tide, this is the trend, this is how the world goes, I'll keep in step with the world. Lord, much truth has been sold down the river in Britain. I pray forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. What have we been doing for old Britain? What have we been doing? Oh Lord, I cry to you. I don't know how guilty I would be found in your presence. That I simply did not care at what was happening in Britain. Just because I was far too busy elsewhere. Oh Lord my God, forgive us, for we are just ordinary people. But have we grown weary in well-doing? Have we said, hey, this is not my league? No, I don't belong to this kind of heavy fighting. I am out of my league and out of my depths here. No, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We have got to meet the challenges. We must be a praying people who persevere in prayer. We must walk before you with fear and trembling. We need this, Lord, with our families. We owe it to our families. There's nothing impossible with you. Come to us, we beseech you, in our poor faith. We cry to you, help thou our unbelief, our small faith. Please, Father, teach us to trust in your almighty hand. You are able to teach us to accomplish far more than we can ask or imagine. Please, Lord, give us faith in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.